forum speaker, a distinguished artist from Seattle, Washington, and one of the brave who's adopted a computer as a medium of human expression. As is his work, Dennis Evans' credentials are most impressive. He has an earned Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Fine Arts, and Master of Fine Arts degrees from University of Washington. In 1980, the National Endowment for the Arts awarded him their Artist Fellowship. He's had no fewer than 70 one-person exhibitions at galleries and museums throughout North America. His work has been in many select group exhibitions from San Francisco to New York. And his work is part of many private and public collections, including the permanent collections of both the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Dennis Evans. Thank you. I'm a wanderer, so the video person's going to be challenged here. I, I don't like to stand in front of a podium. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background, because what I'm going to do for the next hour is take you on a 20-year journey of my work and try to make a little sense of it as best I can. And so we're going to move quickly, but I want to tell you some about my background, because when I talk to people, uh, the diversity of my work is sometimes kind of over, overwhelming. I, was, um, I grew up in central Washington in a little town called Yakima, and I was fortunate enough to have uh, a very good high school there that was run by Jesuit priests. I was raised a Catholic boy, and uh, my mother was French, and we had an incredible sense of ritual in our house. Ritual was very big and important to me. Uh, a lot of times when I talk to people and I say Catholic, I see people getting tense in their seats because of all the guilt and things they experienced in their Catholicism. Mine was just the opposite. Mine was very rich and full and it taught me a great deal about cycles and, ri and traditions and rituals. The great thing about the Jesuits is they believed in an old medieval education where it was a boys school, very strict and very disciplined, and I was taught to read the classics in Latin and Greek. And you'll see in my work that that is still with me, that love of the book and the love of the word. I left Yakima to go to college, and I studied chemistry at the University of Washington because I wanted to be a doctor. I thought I wanted to be a doctor. And uh, I graduated in 1969, and then I was very fortunate enough to win the Richard Nixon lottery, which means I was drafted into the Marine Corps during Vietnam, and I spent two years in the Marine Corps. Uh, luckily, I didn't go to Vietnam because they tested us, and they said, say, how about becoming an officer? And I said, no, I would like to be a corporal. Not a private, just a corporal. And they were very frustrated. The Marines were because they wanted me to be an officer, and I knew better than that because officers died very quickly. They were the first and second lieutenants who led a bunch of crazy people into the jungle, and they were usually the first to die. So anyway, I, they, the Marines made me a teacher, and I taught in a supply school in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. At the end of that two years, I got out of the Marine Corps, and I said to myself, you know, I want to be an artist. And everybody always says, what changed you? Was it the Marine Corps? Was it Vietnam? And it wasn't anything. It was just that I had time to reflect while I was in the Marines, I think. I still don't know the real answer. But I wanted to be an artist, and so I went back to University of Washington and got a Bachelor of Fine Arts in ceramics, and then stayed on and got my Master's of Fine Arts in a, some, a category called design. But what that really was was a catch-all for people like me who wouldn't fit in any other department. And what that meant is during graduate school, I started experimenting with performance work, with video work, with computers, and all sorts of new mediums. And that's where we're going to start um, this slide presentation with some of the work that I did in 1975 to 1980. First, I, I think most of you have a little piece of paper that I brought over. Um, 
The title of this talk is Liber Mundi, Liber Vitae, Latin for the book of the world, the book of life. Um, about mid-range in my life as an artist, which is 20 years, I'm 20 years old as an artist this year, I discovered that I worked in big sets of things. I didn't just make discrete pieces, but I worked in big sets, like alphabets, like the periodic table, like the seven deadly sins. A lot, a lot of it had to do with medieval notions. And what I realized in the last few years is that Augustine, St. Augustine, loved the liberal arts. And he said that there were seven liberal arts, rhetoric, grammar, arithmetic, geometry, history, the arts. And that's what people studied, the seven liberal arts. And this, this old, wonderful Catholicism that has invested itself in me and what, which I've invested myself in has, has manifest this set of categories or the book of the world. And so my challenge as an artist is to write the book of the world as I see it from this, this artist's heart and eyes. And so what we're going to do is start with the theory of religion. And I'm go only four of these chapters are done. And I'm going to um, talk about those. And then I'll talk a little bit about the way I use computers. But computers don't have a great deal to do with my work, except that it's a tool, like a screwdriver. I use a computer every day in my work, but it's not the, the point of the work. It's just a, a tool. And I'm going to hopefully stop a little early. So if you have technical questions about how I use a computer, we can go into that. But I'm not going to really lecture about a computer. I'm going to lecture about my work. So if we could get the lights off and slides on. We'll start with some ceramic work. This is a little lacquered box that was about this big. It was person size. And it had, these are porcelain rods like violin bows. And the bowls are little thrown porcelain bowls. And the bar is porcelain also. And it's an instrument, a musical instrument to be played by myself as a performer. And I, I started playing these instruments that I built out of graduate school. And they were cosmic things to deal with rituals, very natural seasonal rituals. For instance, this was a moon bowl set. And the bowls were all tuned according to the phases of the moon, half moon, quarter moon, full moon. And then the number of rotations of the moon would dictate how many rotations the bar and the bowl would make as it was played. And I played these instruments all throughout the Northwest in museums and art galleries. This is another instrument called the box for skurs and tuned stones and tuned sponges. You could tell I was very serious about this at, at the beginning of my work. I'm never serious, you know. You can see these are some tuned stones. And then there's some whole tone stones over here also, sponges tuned sponges, bowls, and the skurs. And skurs are, it's a real word, but it's not a word. It's actually a verb. But I used it as a noun and called these instruments skurs. And if you want to get some, look up that word S-K-I-R-R -R is what it is made up of. And I would show up at a, a place to play and collect I needed to play the sponges wet, however, because I discovered that when you hit sponges with a skirt, there was no sound. So if you added water, you had this wonderful splashy sound. And then I thought, you know, if you collect water at different times of the year, you'd, it would give you a different sound, right? And so if you, then I thought if you collected water in different places, you would get this incredible difference in sound. So I started sending off to people all over the world to these vials, and they would send back water from different rivers and different locations all over the world. And then I would do performances, and I would demonstrate um, Columbia River water, and then Ganges water from India, and then North Platte River water from Nebraska, and salt water. And so I started doing a lot of comparisons with water, and then the different size sponges and tube sponges. And you can just imagine, I had an entire orchestra. And I used to have people playing with me. I would have so many instruments. Um, here's another one of the early instruments. These are all porcelain, these 
these shafts. They're all handmade. And this was about the sun and the moon. And it was a reenactment of the myth, the Oedipus myth, of the slain of the world parents. The targets, which were the scores, hung on the perimeter of a circle. And they were located where the sun rose on that particular day. That was the sun, the father target. And the moon target, the mother target, was hung at the, the site of the sun setting. And then the scurs, the arrows, were shot through the scores and exploded against the wall. And that was the piece. Well, in that myth, in the slain of the world parents, the hero, the performer, in the real myth, is slain by the father. He actually is castrated by the father. Well, the first time I did this, I wasn't castrated, thank God. But um, you, if you notice, the scurs, one set of scurs, the solar scurs, had edges on them. And as I shot the, the arrow or the scur, those edges sliced open my hand. And as the scur hit the target, blood was splattered all over the target. And my god, the myth became true. It was very dramatic, I must say. And I had 22 stitches in my hand. So um, this was early in my, in my performance career. And you can imagine I was getting quite notorious because every time I would do a performance, something like that would happen. Maybe I was playing one of my bowls, and it was a particular bowl that was on fire because I liked fire a lot. It was pretty important to the water and fire combination. And perhaps the bowl would spin off the bar and hit the floor, and we'd have a fire in a museum. And it was always fun because the smoke alarms are very sensitive in museums. And luckily, we never had a, a water event. But so after a while, I got to the point that I w was tired of doing performances in art galleries and in museums. And I wanted to get out into nature with them into a much more real place and confront people who were not coming to an art event and expecting something sort of exciting to happen. So I made a box like this, which had backpack straps on the back of it. And I took off and out into nature. And I would go to Mexico, and I would go all through the Northwest with this backpack and just show up someplace, open the box, and start working, start doing a performance. If no one was there, I would just start working, just in a very ritualized manner. And people would then come along and stand and look at me and for a while think, gee, they just let somebody out of a crazy house. And then they would slowly start talking to me and we would create a dialogue about what I was doing and it became pretty interesting. Some of the pieces that I did I like to call geographic acupuncture. And they were big drawings on the sand or some kind of earth where I would make marks in the sand. I would take these scurs, put them in the sand, say porcelain bowls in another configuration, and make giant configurations. And then as the tide would come in, they would wash away. And they only lasted minutes. They were ephemeral things. And then I would go pick up all my porcelain things as the tide went out and re do the drawing, the new drawing. So they were very ephemeral. And I used a lot of raw materials, natural things, leaves, burnt, rotten things, a lot of oppositional pieces. And these black lines are actually sun shadows. They're not carved into the sand. They're really shadows of the sun. So these things were truly ephemeral drawings. And within minutes, as the earth turned, the, sh the lines of the drawings would shift, and then the piece was over. So at that point, I, I decided that what I was really doing was very ephemeral. So I founded an institute called the Institute for the Conservation of Ephemeral Events. It's a sort of an oxymoron. But I like that very much, because I was trying to conserve, by taking pictures, these ephemeral events. And in doing that, I would bring home from these, uh, these forays out in nature rolls of film that I would always, often bring somebody that would take pictures of uh, my work. And then I would have these things to show. And then these would turn into drawings later on. And just a, a sort of a sideline to that, the person that took all these pictures ended up being my wife. 
about five years later. And she's still sort of my documentarian. While I was doing all this work, I was continually making scores for my instrument boxes. And this is what some of the scores looked like. They were, um, see, I can look at this and I would know exactly how to play it, but very few other people would. But one of the nice stories about my scores is often in exhibitions, I would have a room full of scores like this and then the instrument box is in a room. And one day, a young man came up to me and he says, I want to play your music. I know exactly how to play this music. And he thought he could read my scores. And this was very early into, the, into my foray into this work. And I realized that I couldn't let him play it because he would break the porcelain shafts. And that's how I actually started uh, performing the work because he said, there's this concert of new music at Evergreen State College. And he says, I want to play your music. And I said, you can't play my music. You'll break them. And he said, well, then you play them. And I, he was backing me into the corner. And I said, all right, I will. And so I bought a tuxedo. And that's how I started doing the performances. So a lot of this early work, these scores, were, is, um, is what I did for about six years, from 1975 to 1981. This was one of my favorite instruments that I built. It's a sled that floats, obviously, and it holds about 160 pounds worth of material. So I could go out. I was limited prior to that to shallow water because I had to walk out into shallow water. But now I could actually go out into deep water with this and tow this behind my little formal rubber raft if I wanted to. So um, this is some shallow water events. Notice I have formal waders on here so I wouldn't get my tails or my legs wet or dirty. Um, I would go out in ponds with this and do these little flotillas. And the porcelain bowls, I would, those are called rain bowls. And they're all very, very thin, paper thin, and they float. And when the rain rains upon them, they tinkle, quite lovely, tinkle. And so, being sort of the scientist artist that I was, I said, well, to have a nice counterpoint to the tinkle, we should have bowls on fire. So I would make hundreds of these bowls, and I'd set 50 on fire and 50 to let the rain tinkle in. And then we had this, or this sort of concert of tinkle, 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 and tinkle, 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 And um, it was fun. These are what I call zero entropic driftolas, which means you just start them and then they just go wherever they want. Often in these ponds, ducks would swim around wondering after they settled down, they would start cruising in and they would swim between these things and it was great. They'd create currents and the bowls would go all over the place. One of the last instruments I built was this one called 100 Tuned Stones for Puget Sound. Actually, 100 Tuned Sounding Stones for Puget Sound. Now, what a sounding is, is when you go out in the front of a boat and you take a weight and you drop it down and you measure depths. You take a sounding and you measure fathoms. And the actually, the uh, two fathoms is called Mark Twain. That's where Mark Samuel Clemens got his name. Is they would be out in front of a boat and throw this off, and they would go two fathoms, and they'd say Mark Twain. So I thought taking soundings, what a great idea! But rather than taking depth soundings, I'm just going to measure the splashes. And since I knew that if you played stones with skurs in different waters and they sounded differently, then if you took splashes with stones. They would all sound differently, both in different locations and if the stones were tuned. So I did a very extensive studies going out in a rowboat, always with my tuxedo on, in Puget Sound, taking soundies and recording splashes. And I produced all these little cassettes and albums of, of my soundings. They were pretty um, splashy. <laughs> And this, this um, it's hard to see, but this is a grid of 100 photographs that, of a camera that was set up right on shore. And as I moved in a grid of a mile, which we had sort of points that I could locate myself doing triangulation, and, it, and I took a sounding at every one of the points, the camera took a picture. So you'll see the rowboat start on the side of the frame and then slowly move across till it gets to this side. And that's actually a mile with a 
wide angle lens, and then I moved out that way until I was a little dot. So that, w that went along with the, the tape and the instrument. That particular piece actually traveled to the Smithsonian in 1980 for a, a handmade musical instrument show where people made handmade dulcimers and harpsichords and all kinds of beautiful things. And they took that instrument of mine as one, it was actually right in the entry of the big show. And I got more hate mail from traditional instrument makers than I can ever believe. They were really irritated that my stones were in their show. But I loved it. All right, the last piece in the theory of religion was a giant, giant piece called the Passion Play. And it was a 12-hour performance like an opera that starred these boxes. And these boxes all had harnesses on them. Each of these was a station in an hour. And the harnesses allowed me to wear the boxes. And the boxes imposed the use of my body. Sometimes this one fit over my head, so I had to actually walk with this and cut a big heavy furrow in the pond. Each one of these had a different sort of imposition on the body. And it was, a, it was an opera, and it was a romance, and a passion play about a man and a woman and the story of life to death. It started at 6 in the morning. Every hour, there was a performance using one of these boxes. And then I would rest till the, next, the first of the next hour. And um, so there were 10, 12 stations and 12 sets of boxes. This is what they looked like installed in a museum. Along with each one of the stations was a score that told what was to happen and some photos of the actual performance and how the box worked. And that's now a big book. It was performed in a pond in August 1980. And about 150 people were there for the entire 12 hours. There was music uh, during the performance, opera music that was appropriated. And there was a lot of natural sounds. And a beautiful setting, actually, as you can tell. Some of, the, some of the hours had a man and a woman involved, and others were just the man. All right, that's, that body of work comprises the theory of religion, and that's being put into a big book. Each one of these chapters is being put into a book about the size of this. I've got two done, and I'm working on the third now. And then they will eventually, all seven, will go into a box, and there'll be a box set. And there's text by curators and museum people to accompany these. So the, the next piece I want to talk about is the first one called the 72 blank of God or the 72 names of God. You know, you're never supposed to say the name of God. So we have the 72 of God. Why 72? Because in the Jewish tradition, there's the tetragrammaton which says there are 72 names of God. And those names make up the total aspect of God. The other reason I like 72, that's 72 is a very special number. And I, numbers are important to me, you'll see with the rest of this work, is that you can divide it by 9, which is a wonderful number. And so it makes 8. 72 divided by 9 makes 8. And there are 8 days of creation. We think 7, but I know that God is politically correct. And he would never, he or she, would never make Adam and Eve on the same day. So I knew, knowing that, I gave a day for Adam and a day for Eve. So we had eight days of creation. So this piece was divided up into eight groups of nine. And it was a giant book that had its pages torn out, sort of. And the, each page was framed. And each page, each eight pages plus this center panel made up one day of creation. So it was, a, it was like the book of Genesis. And what it also was, was an encyclopedia of ways that man has depicted their deity. So I sort of pillaged the world, all sorts of religious cultures, 
and it read as first the overlay of the tetragrammaton, 72 pieces that all depicted a deity, the deity. It also had a structure of the seven or eight days of creation, and it also was the depiction of the way cultures have depicted their deity. And lastly, it was an encyclopedia of painting because there was one, two, three, four, five little elements on each of these drawings, times 72 is a couple hundred, so there are a couple hundred examples of painting, different styles of painting. So it, it had all those different levels of meaning. Each day, the day that man was created, the animals, the earth, had, it, had their own sets. So in the Adam piece, for instance, there were many sort of male depictions from, from different cultures, mostly Greek culture in this set. The feminine. Okay, that, that was the set, the 72 blank of God. The next big chapter was called The Critique of Pure Writing. And this piece changed my work somewhat because I suddenly started doing larger paintings. But I was still thinking of groupings and I wanted to do a piece about writing. So I thought the alphabet's a perfect structure. So I gave myself a challenge that the, the pieces would all have a book on them and they would all have uh, a letter of the alphabet, and the letter would become the word that organized the piece. So in doing that, I also realized that there's this wonderful reference to alphabet books called ABC Deries, which are children's books. A is for apple or A is for something. And so I took that notion and I created a book within a book so that the book called The Critique of Pure Writing has each of the paintings depicted, but it also has a story about the paintings. And I'm going to read a couple of these so you get a sense of the flavor of these. This is binary. The first was, was um, the A piece, which was, I forget what that, ambivalent. B was for binary. C was for congruent. This is dogmatic. I'm going to read you the, the uh, description of dogmatic. The notion that these were books was important and I, what I did when I built these and constructed them is I treated each painting as if it was about a book of dogma so that this construction is now the book of dogma. This is what I wrote about it. The order of causal chains. Here is the bookshelf of shadows a lintel of the great dogmatic texts, a shrine to the great principle of cause and effect. The world's greatest historical mythologies are present here in their husk form. The images on all the pages are depicted mostly in black and white and very often only in the shadow form or out of focus. These works continually emit a quiet hum of thousands of voices reciting authoritarian texts in various languages dating from the beginning of time. Without being touched, this stack of tomes will sometimes abruptly reorganize itself, and occasionally a book will fly from the shelf to the floor. It has also been observed that some texts go either completely blank or the letters grow so large that the page is totally black. So each of these pieces have a fiction that goes along with them, and they're actually very large and they're very physical. The books are real books with painted spines, and the surfaces of these are beeswax. So I'm going to take a little a moment to talk about technical things here so we can talk a little bit about computers. The, I'm going to show you that a lot of the next work that you're going to see are constructions like this, like these, and they're very some very large, and the the material is called encaustic, and it's beeswax on canvas 
on board. So I actually construct a board, a, a panel, that, and I stretch canvas on the panel, and then I put hot beeswax on the panel horizontally, poured on, and then I paint pigment on the beeswax, and I burn it in with a torch. So it is very alchemical. The pigments actually swim in the wax, and heavy pigments, some colors are heavier than others, they go down to the bottom of the wax, and other pigments float up on the top. And then I put some more wax on it, I put some other pigment on it, and I build up these surfaces that are very tra semi-translucent, filled with pigment, so they become very rich and gorgeous. And, and in real life, they have this surface that is quite extraordinary. Then I apply imagery and text, and the way that is done is, is I use a computer, and I can type, text and size it and do anything I want on the computer and then I send it to a plotter which has a knife in it and it cuts vinyl stencils and once the, the stencil is cut somebody picks all the, the letters out or the images you'll see there's a lot of images I use too they weed it it's called weeding and then there's tape put on and it's transferred to the wax and the top tape is pulled off and then we paint through that with oil paint again, and then pull the stencil off, and then burn it in with a torch. So it's a very primitive type of technique using fire, and the surface is often light on fire, and yet we're using 20th century technology also, using a computer. And the computer is not just limited to type. It can take images. I can, take, I can make a drawing and scan it, bring it into the, the sort of platform that I'm using, change it, do any kind of manipulation with it, size it, and then send it to the cutter. So the computer is used both in keeping all the texts that I use, and when I often refer to we, I mean that because I have apprentices that help me, because this, this is very labor-intensive work, and there's a lot of uh, people involved in the, in the building of these pieces. So back to the book. This was the E number, enigmatic. It's about six feet long. And those were actual vials of, let's see if I can return. These are little glass vials filled with powdered pigments. So they're very three-dimensional. And it's a real book on the surface. Fallacious. I want to read that, this one for you also. It's one of my favorite. This is an alphabetical encyclopedia from Alpha to Omega, which belongs to the domain of God alone. It is open to the chapter entitled The Great Pyramid Proof of God with subtopics of God's problem and the proof needed. So nice to know God has a problem. This is a complete book of trickery and deception and most probably was used by God to create philosophical dilemmas and conundrums for Adam and Eve in the garden. The cover, which is not visible, is a, made of golden snakeskin, elaborately embossed with the image of an apple and the word logos lettered in ancient Adamic script. What I love is when people see this and then they read that and then they look at me and they say, is that really on the cover of the book? This is the G piece for geomancy. This is poured lead. These panels are very thick. They look like they're big, heavy pieces. They're very physical. It's etched glass on the surface. Brass, etched brass. This word gnosis is etched in glass over this painted book on the front. So they're very dimensional. All the glass is etched using the computer system. Stencils are cut. It's applied to the glass. And then the glass is sandblasted. The book of hermeneutics, the science of interpretation. There's codes all throughout this piece, all kinds of codes. This is the Braille code on the frame, drilled into the steel frame. Judicial, the J piece. This is lead, 
Again, very big. These are actual pulleys. If you turn the turnbuckles, they will, the pulleys run into cables going in this box, which are hooked to the book inside. So you can literally turn the turnbuckles and pull the book apart. This had to be judicial because it's called The Theory of Moments, an illustrated work on matter in its stressed state. I thought that was appropriate for attorneys. And actually, an attorney bought it. <laughs> matter in its stressed state. Phenomenological. Again, a vial of pigment and a bound book. And then a gravity-held piece of bamboo. Book of Query. The X, the word, the piece, the X letter was just X. The Y was the yin and yang. The book of changes. The oracle. Okay, that, I just gave you some samples of the um, critique of pure writing. Now I'm going to start with three installations which will sum up the last bodies of work that I've done. And so what you're seeing is 20 years of work which started with performance work. And I've sh it's not all in chronological sequence. The paintings, some of the paintings are just what I'm doing now. But I put them in this order for another reason. Um, we're we're going to look at now the, the fourth book or a chapter called The Science of Secrets. And within that are three installations, the garden, for Remembered Desires is the first one. The second is Mnemosyne's Alphabet. And the third, The Philosopher's Wedding. An inst uh, several lo long time ago, artists started building installations. They started doing total environments. Rather than just do a painting on the wall, they built the entire space and often constructed the space and the size of the space and the configuration of it to fit the work inside of it. It's a common form. It's very popular now. I started doing them in 1980, right after I stopped doing performances. I started doing installations. And the reasoning was I wanted you, the audience, to start experiencing what I was experiencing as a performer in the ponds. I wanted, I wanted you not to just stand there and watch, but suddenly have to go through these, these dark, smelly, different sorts of physical, very active environment. So I started building environments. This is not the first one I built, but this one fits into this giant book I'm doing. We were looking through a doorway in which you'd have to go over a sort of bridge, a rounded bridge, into a room. The room was painted this deep red, and it had fences built in it. So you were sort of walking into an indoor garden. The room was very hot. I had the temperature turned up, so it was always warm. And it was filled with tons of flowers. And I would go to a florist and get out of their dumpsters all their cut flowers that were starting to wilt and bring them into this room so that there was always the sense of decay and smelling, sort of rotting flowers. But, but not in the sense of really bad rotting, but the, as flowers start to go, that, that kind of smell. Plus, I had tons of spices and hops and lots of pungent things. So it was a very sensory overload. The piece had a very um, specific structure to it. This is looking back into, you can see how some of the pieces had hops and spices on shelves and all through the floor area. And here's flowers. The piece had three different aspects that were very important. It, it was. Um, it was like an, an allegory of how to read, in that there were so many symbols and so many symbol systems that one had to go in and start to interpret it. And how one interprets was what it was about. It, was, it had three different systems. One was the tarot cards. One was the Kabbalah, which is the Jewish tree of life, which has 10 sephirah. And one was the myth of Hermes. And Hermes was the god who invented writing. He was associated with the Egyptian god of Toth, who invented writing. So there, the piece was about reading and interpretation. 
And there were all kinds of clues, lots of information, but it was an overload of symbols. The next piece that I want to show you was called Nemozenes Alphabet. And it was shown at the Boise Art Museum about two years ago. And the room was constructed specifically for the piece. And the plan of the piece was cruciform in that one end of the room was culture, which is the blue wall with the gold piece in a grid form. The other end of the room was nature, which had a cave wall painted with horns, antlers up at the top. One side of the room was about mythos or sensation, and one side of the room was about logos or reason. And it was a, an, again, a room that was one piece, meant to be one piece, that dealt with the idea of binaries, of sensation and reason, mythos and logos, nature and culture, and how nature progresses towards culture. The panels on the walls, which were like stations of the cross, had little candles in them, and they projected light through pieces of etched glass that then threw the reflection or the shadow, the actually they projected their image on the glass onto the surface behind, much to be an analogy of Plato's caves and the forms, shadow forms. One side had only images and colors and physical aspects, and one side had only black and white and text. And you can see how this word, you can barely see how it projected on the wall, and the, then there was text within there. The, the images progressed from Egyptian to cuneiform to Phoenician up to Roman and Greek type. The dark part is the shadow and the etching is the etching. The white is the etching. <clears throat> and then hanging in front of the culture was a book with the word husk etched on the glass. And it was a book that had one side all black and white and one side all in color. The last piece that I just finished is called The Philosopher's Wedding. And again, it was a very specific sized room that was constructed exactly to my dimensions. The walls were covered with felt, gray felt, so they, we, they would absorb light. And then these panels hung in the room. The floor, the white on the floor is salt, crushed salt. There's a ton and a half of salt. And you can see, again, like a garden, there's a fence. So you, to enter the room, you had to walk in the salt. The room was divided in two, where one side had only black and white, only very rational text, precise things. And the other side had color. It was called the philosopher's wedding. There were 12 stations, and there were seven days involved. The first station, the first two stations were these hanging blown vials of liquid. One was the groom, and one was the, bride, the bridegroom and the bride. The bride was in the red one, that was Venus. The groom was in the green one, the vegetal. They hung hovering in this room and light was projected on them and mixed on the floor, on the salt. It's very hard to show slides of installations because installations are really magical in the smell, texture, sound, light, and everything. These little placards in front of each of these stations, you know, they're like stations of the cross to this Catholic, would have numbers so that if, if you entered it and you paid attention and you followed the numbers and read the pla placards, you would find yourself weaving between this side of the room and the, the, the female, the mythos side, and the logical side. And you would zigzag like a needle, weaving your way up to the top. And so you would become the guest at the wedding, and eventually there was an evolution of form and message up to the final sort of altar to the bride and the groom. I'm going to show you sort of individual shots of these paintings. And again, these are these encaustic pa paintings that are about this big. And they have steel frames, and they're thick, 
and quite often they have very physical objects attached to the front. The other small ingredient to these that doesn't read in the photographs is that there's etched glass hanging in front of the canvases or the paintings very often and that glass is meant to be lit very precisely with a, the right kind of light which then projects the image that's on the glass into the painting and it's a wonderful metaphor again that without light there is no knowledge you can't they don't work without light which is a w wonderful notion and it's part of the painting so the paintings when one buys these paintings they must install a light to make it work this is a, a bronze book covered with lead on the bottom the, this surface let's see if we can focus this one a little bit no <laughs> well I'm not getting any place the, this surface is quite extraordinary because the, the, what gives it that incredible cosmic sense is that when the wax is molten hot, I take dry pigments wearing a very special mask and I put the dry pigments into the molten wax and it just explodes and it, it makes surfaces very much like granite and marble were made and is still being made with molten rock. They're very lovely. Well, we better focus. Not so good. Do you have a manual focus there? It would be nice if we could get these closer. I'm not, we're almost at the end though, so it's not important. But we're way out now. Here we go. That's good enough. This is like a giant sky chart. It's got constellations printed on the into the wax and burned into the wax and then there's big pieces of etched cut glass hanging in front like almost mechanical diagrams or instruments this is a column of glass a glass column with a from a to z words etched on it lake man nose can't read all those and then a shredded book inside of it. These are copper containers, copper cylinders mounted on copper and an etched glass over the front. That's lead, molded lead across the front. Lead and glass bound together, fused together. And this was the final piece, which had all these books, all the books were hand painted on the ends with small little paintings in them. And this is a giant cave wall again that's built up with beeswax and an etched book. The book is blank, it's just white page and the etching of the glass in front when it's lit properly projects the word into the blank book, which was the altar where the two sides come together. So, let's turn on some lights. So that's what I've been doing the last 20 years. And um, I'd love to answer any questions that you have. Yes? No, it, that's a good question. The way installations work is they're usually done in museums. And usually museums will call an artist and say, we would like you to do an installation for us and it'll be up for two months or something like that. And then they often disappear. I've done about 10 installations and um, they, after they, they show for two months or so, then they become parts and go into something else. But what I am starting to do now is to sell walls to different institutions. For instance, um, the first room I showed, the garden room, one of the major walls is owned by Cheney, 
uh, Eastern Washington University and it's in their art building. It's right when you walk in the building, there's a big section where the wall's been painted the color, the fence is there, the pieces, the section is there. So that at any point, if I wanted to put the piece back together, I could borrow the parts from people that own the parts. So I, I work modularly for that reason, so they could be reconstructed. Yes? Well, it, it, um, I can't remember exactly its name, but it, I think that was called the Emperor. And so it, it does have a part of the whole, but it is part of a whole, you know. But, you know, when you think about the, like the alphabet series, um, it would be great if somebody owned all 26 books of the alphabet, but that doesn't happen much. But I, I will tell you a good story about that. The 72 pieces, I, when I did those, I thought, well, how am I going to sell these? I would love somebody to buy all of them. And then I thought, well, I could sell them in sets, like chapters, the first day of creation, second day, or whatever. And that made sense. But I kept thinking, boy, it would be nice if somebody bought the whole thing. And so six weeks before the show opened, I started talking to Microsoft. And I said, you guys ought to buy this whole thing. And they did. They bought the whole thing. So that whole thing is still in one intact in one of their buildings in Redmond, Washington. It wasn't easy, though, convincing them to buy it. <laughs> and I gave it away. <laughs> yes? I have a, yes, I do. I have a, a 4,300 square foot house that I live in. And I live in the middle, three stories. and. Um, my wife and I work, both work there together, and we have only about less than a third of it is where we live, and the rest is our studios. And the studios are, we have glass kilns, we have welding shops, we have wood shops, we have all kinds of little rooms that, for different functions. We can do almost everything. The only thing we don't do is cast bronze there, but we do, we fire glass, slump glass, uh, weld, grind, do all the wax, everything. So it's all in one place, sandblasting and everything. And you have to, it, it would have to do that to do that kind of work because it's so diverse, really. I do have uh, apprentices, yeah. Um, well, about three. Yeah. Yes. Well, when I was doing performance work, when I first started it, it was the actual performance was meaningful. And then I became very frustrated because that was, could never be conveyed except to the few people that were, saw the real thing. And I didn't like to video them. I wouldn't video them. I, I did take pictures of them because I knew that I wanted to at least talk about them like this. But I would never say this is what the performance was. So the actual performance was the thing. And that was very frustrating to me. And that is why probably I also made props for my performances that were so beautifully crafted so that they could be presented in a gallery museum situation and they would evoke something that you would see these things and you might see pictures and you might see the scores and then you would, it would take you one more step. So my things have always been very heavily crafted because I have a, a, quite a love of beautiful objects. I love art. I love things to be beautiful. But I also want them to be gritty in terms of their intelligence and in terms of what they demand of the audience. They're challenging. They're dense. They're time release art is what I call them. They take days and weeks to, to let them leak out what they're about. And sometimes years. And sometimes they never leak out. Sometimes they're so opaque. I, I must say that earlier on my pieces were almost too dense. For, for an audience, for my audience. And now I think they're getting more singular and more to the point. What I'm working on now is this um, chapter six, the four forces of the universe. 
and there are four chapter, sub-chapters in that. One's called the alchemical studies, quite far along on that. The Kabbalistic studies, which is the, law, the, the Jewish mystical interpretation of the text. Again, more work about text. Doing some work on divination, oracles, the I Ching, geomancy, different types of oracles. And then the fourth force of the universe I'm looking for. So if anyone has, I have blank statement, if anyone has that one figured out, send this back to me so I, I can start that. I haven't figured out that one. Come on, you must have more questions. I have four cats. Yes. Right. Right, I have a computer system that I was telling Tom a little earlier, it's a Chevrolet, it's just an old PC that's a 486, and then I, had a, I have a friend who's, I call him my bit brain, because he knows all about the computer, how to take it apart, and so we bought this machine, and then we took all the boards out and put in new boards, so it would do, it's not really fancy, but it just, it will, it will do what I need it to do. And so it's a 486 machine, and I have a scanner, and I have a color printer, and I have a plotter, and the plotter has a knife in it. And then I run vinyl through the plotter, and the knife cuts out the stencils. So I can make the, the stencils as long as I want, and they each come out 20 inches wide, and then I can tile them up to be as big as I want. So if I take, say, do a drawing of a skeleton, full, just an entire skeleton, and I want to put that on the canvas, but I want it to be 10 by 10, I just scan that skeleton, put it on the computer, tell it how big I want it, send it to the plotter, and it starts cutting, and about two days later, it wouldn't take that long, but it would take a while, I would have this thing all in panels that I would have to lay up and register, which is not hard to do. And then we'd paint it and pull it off, and we'd have that big drawing on there. So it's cheating. See, we really don't even have to be good artists anymore. Yes? Well, I think my works are very conceptual, yes, but, but I'm, a, I'm a complicated artist in that they, they have a lot of, con the concept's very important, but they're so material and so lovely that they're hardly purely conceptual. They're pretty physical, too. So, but I like, I think of myself that the conceptual, the intellectual is important, really important to me. Because uh, the art that I was raised on, the Catholic art, the icons and everything, that, was not, that conveyed uh, lots of information. You know, they, every, the iconography of, of old um, medieval and middle age paintings, which were mostly religious, are full of symbols and analogies and metaphors. And I love that. I love art that's loaded. And I don't like art that's empty. <laughs> but that's editorializing, you know. I mean, you can, I have very good friends who are abstract painters who say, this is not empty. And they're right, it's not, but it doesn't have the information that I want. You know, mine are loaded heavy on the logo side. <clears throat> well, the bees aren't on strike yet, so that's okay. I buy beeswax from a candle manufacturer, and I buy 20 kilo boxes at a time, 44 pounds, and it comes in little pure white pellets, so it's been bleached, so it's really clean, it's not yellow like beautiful beeswax is. And so uh, um, I, it's really pure, and it smells wonderful. When I open the boxes, it smells great, and in the spring, the bees all come in my studio because they smell it. It's really, it really drives my cats crazy. They're swatting at the bees. <laughs> But it's a dangerous medium, too. It's the fumes, you have to be very careful. It's um, notoriously an artist's killer. Because you put, you put in the hot beeswax Damar varnish, which is really f very pungent. It's a beautiful smell, but it's, you really, it's very fumey sort of material. So you have to work with masks. And I work up in the, I go up to the roof of my studio when I do that, so I'm outside pretty much. I've had some canvases light on fire 
with certain pigments that really are hot and blow like silver is notoriously, it's got a lot of um, phosphorus in it, I guess. And w <laughs> one time I had a small canvas, luckily, and it, when I hit the torch on it, it just went, whoo, it was totally on fire. And I knew there was no putting it out. So I threw it out the window of my studio and I'm on a hill and my neighbor below is an older woman who was out weeding her garden and she looked up and saw this flaming canvas coming out of the window going hoo, hoo, hoo. and it was like God is coming down on me you know it, it landed many feet from her but it was she said now Dennis quit that and she was yes I use pure uh, pigment just you actually I use I I don't use powdered pigment much I use some powdered pigment pure pigment good stuff but I often use uh, oil paint and I paint that on and then burn that in because it's less toxic the powdered pigment is so fine that it with the heat it just fills your room it's really dangerous I, I keep saying that because encaustic is a lot of people are starting to use it now it's really getting to be popular and um, it's really dangerous you got to know you got to be careful because you won't you'll hurt yourself now and you'll in 10 years you'll pay so and that time moves fast <laughs> But, you know, I have to say then, since you're not going to ask me any more questions, somebody gave me a book yesterday. It said, Why Do Cats Paint? And I have four cats, and I have some of the best studio cats in the world, and I've never seen them paint. So somebody's fooling somebody about that. <laughs> anyway, thank you for having me here.